Hello, and welcome to the Conspiracy of Goodness podcast, where you'll hear from thought leaders in a wave of goodness and progress well underway in the world that almost no one knows about. This podcast will give you hope for the future and give you all kinds of practical new insights to make leaps forward in your own daily life. The bottom line is this, there are people tackling some of the world's most difficult problems and they think a bright future is possible. We need to know what they see. I'm Dr. Linda Ulrich, founder of Ever Widening Circles. Since 2014, we've written thousands of articles about insight and innovation going uncelebrated. And along the way, we've been having these incredible conversations with thought leaders that we're now sharing with the world. Today, we're going to meet Nancy Sherman. Oh my gosh, I've been, I came out across her work and I just could not wait to bring her work to, to light here on the podcast. Nancy's a distinguished professor of philosophy at Georgetown University and also the inaugural, I'm going to read this right, the inaugural distinguished chair of ethics at the United States Naval Academy. Well, <laughs> the, the span of Nancy's work is so beautiful and um, can, we can go down all kinds of rabbit holes today, but we're gonna pick one thing that she's, really, um, that she's really working hard to get out there into the world these days. And that's a concept of stoicism. She's got a brand new book called Stoic Wisdom, Ancient Lessons for Modern Resilience. Now that's something we need these days. <laughs> Modern resilience. Oh my gosh. So Nancy, that's just a tiny slice of who you are and what you're doing in the world. Introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more. Well, thank you for so much for having me, Linda. It's really a pleasure. Um, I uh, teach philosophy. I teach philosophy at Georgetown. And uh, I've always been fascinated with ancient ethics what the ancient world can tell us about the, uh, about the state of the world today. And the newest book that uh, Linda so kindly mentioned oh. is it's got a great cover of one of my friends told me, you know, sort of Roman, probably Roman uh, sarcophagus, a Roman tomb where they bury the dead. And uh, it just came out. And I really wanted to think about this idea of a, a Greek and Roman Stoicism as teaching us how to flourish. It's about how to thrive in a way that's connected with each other. So I guess the theme of my work for years, whether it's been with the military, I've worked with uh, not just the Naval Academy, but um, West Pointers and enlisted um, all spans uh, during the current wars and previously first Gulf Wars, my colleagues were Vietnam veterans, um, has been about ways of thriving even in challenging times. Uh, so Stoicism is uh, very popular right now. It's having its moment. Some say it's the, <laughs> the, the Western Zen. Why? because it's always been interested in uh, finding equanimity or calm, mm -hmm. but not by mm, or silent retreats. It's actually pretty chatty, um, chit chat, you know, about how, did I do good today or did I not do good today? Sometimes it's too harsh on yourself, but, it's, but it also has lots of ways in which you can try to prepare for the future because you might otherwise be blindsided. So right. some, of, some folks in the um, in the tech world would call that life hacks, ways mm -hmm. that you kind of get around a problem by thinking in advance. So they, they were really brilliant, but they're, the Stoics, um, as I was saying, throughout my career, I've been interested in emotions. Uh, for whatever reason, that has been my signature area because in my field, which te you know, tends to be very cold, calculate, not calculating, but kind of rough edged <clears throat> and very square, you know, square the corner kind of thinking. Emotions just fell to the side. And that's uh, out there in the tradition. One British philosopher called them mist on your mental windscreen. Now, <laughs> I 
just drove across country. There was mist on my windscreen. <laughs> but I don't think emotions are just fog. Right. They actually are enlightening and insightful. And I actually think the Stoics aren't those folks that you know many think of as sort of British would be stiff upper lip or emotionless. They actually have one of the most sophisticated accounts of emotions, but they are also interested in helping you find good emotions, ones that aren't disabling mm -hmm. or you know maladaptive, you might say, that ones that get you in trouble. So I so this book is really about <clears throat> ways that people from all walks, whether you're a frontline worker as a, you know, a, a, a military person, as I said, I've worked with the military for close to 30 years at this point, closely on coming back from war, going to war, into reintegrating um, back home, um, coming into my classroom right out. We'll of the have a pause. It, one of our internet connections is unstable. Um, Brittany? Did you, was it, was it Nancy or me? It was probably me. Um, it didn't say on my end. Okay. And, it, and it, there wasn't a pause for Nancy. I didn't hear her pause, but we can, okay. we can redo her, what she just said. Let's yeah. Can... Um, Nancy, where, where I saw you pause was when you said I worked for the military for years and years. So if you want to pick it up there, they'll just, um, they'll just bring us right in. One second. So, Okay, so I've worked for the military for years and years, and I've seen folks getting ready to deploy, men and women, folks coming home to my classes at Georgetown, having just come back from Marja. Um, and, you know, as a sniper, I've had women whose spouses have been Marines out there. And the concern is how do you go on? Sometimes it's been really, really hard. Um, but the message in all of my work, and especially in, um, you know, in, in this work, you might not think Stoics are, a, are about connecting, that, you know, you might think it's self-reliance, it's tough grit, that you go it alone. That's not really what the Stoics teach. So if there's a message in my mission, the message is that Stoicism is about bringing people together for mutual support and that the Stoics were the first actual cosmopolitans. They thought that we're all connected because we all share in reason. That, that's you know, a very ancient thought. And they were the ones that said, there aren't borders, we share in humanity. So that's just a sort of a beginning point, Linda, to get us that going. That is lovely. Okay, so Nancy, I got to tell you, I grew up in a little farming town in Illinois, and I, I'm going to have you start even higher about the topic of, of stoicism, like the 100,000 foot look, because I remember growing up, and the only connection I had to this concept growing up was that um, where I grew up, if, if you were really if you were really stiff upper lipping something, I mean, like one of the highest compliments you could give somebody is to say, oh, you're so stoic. Um, or if someone were ill and they were just toughing it out, you'd say, oh, she is being so stoic. And this was, this was a high praise. But um, I don't remember ever knowing it was that word was connected to a philosophy or anything. So in case there is somebody that's run, that's had that same life path that I have, where it just didn't come up, I mean, the way I understand Stoicism is that it's about a two, it's not a religion. That's the main thing. I remember probably thinking when I did hear about it that it was a religion, but it's not a religion. And it's about a 2000 year old way of thinking about, about how the world works. Get, tell it, tell okay. me, you can say sure. it better than me. That's great. So I don't know how Stoicism with a capital S became Stoicism with a little s, but yeah. Part of it is that, yes, it's Greco-Roman. So we're talking about uh, around 200 before the Common Era and maybe 200 to 300 after. So if you think about ancient philosophy a little bit, you know, maybe there's Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, the Stoics <clears throat> come after Aristotle. And 
they, so they are around the time of Judeo-Christianity, but they, and they get absorbed a lot. And by not only folks around the turn of that millennium, but into our founding fathers of our country, Jefferson, Washington, they all read Stoics because they were easy books to read. People, the, the Roman Stoics were street philosophers. They were easy to pick up. Someone like Seneca, easy to read. It may not seem easy to read to us, but it was very easy to read. And many read Latin even at the time. Someone like Epictetus, a skinny little book called The Handbook, um, right, writing around the um, first century of the Common Era. Easy to pick up, little pithy wisdom. So I think the idea of, of, of being able to handle deprivation, hardship, mm -hmm. that is uh, stoic. And having been around the military for a long time, they're pretty, you know, inelegant phrases. It wasn't just tough it up and stiff upper lip. It was embrace the suck, suck it up <laughs> and truck on. That is what I heard from my sailors and soldiers day in and day out, suck it up and truck on. And working closely in those communities, I realized there was a, there was a high cost to buttoning up your emotions. I also have training in psychotherapy. I don't practice, but I've got training. And I know the cost of, and we know the cost historically mm -hmm. of not thinking about your emotions, of pocketing them away and letting them bubble up after 50 years, 75 years, and you know, that kind of that, that kind of um, failure to kind of look at it. And that isn't stoicism. So stoicism that I think about, and you know, and, and these are not household names. Who thinks of Zeno, Obsidium, Chrysippus, Cleantes? But you might have heard of Seneca. You might have heard of Cicero. Um, he was a transmitter of these texts. And so these ancient texts are in fabulous translations. And those of us that kind of make a living from thinking about these texts um, are showing their relevance right now. They have been picked up by lots of people because some of it is kind of, as I say, it's easier to read than some other kinds of philosophy. And some people use it really for insight philosophy, but also that poorly in the sense of stuff away your emotions. That is not my uh, understanding. Here's an image that just comes to mind a lot that Marcus Aurelius, so he's another Stoic, he was an emperor, as many know. Um, and he was like anyone in that period, so we're talking about the first, cent first century of the common era, he was trained in Stoicism. That was just your household philosophy. You had a tutor, ah. you had a tutor, they all taught you Stoicism. You kind of memorized it. That you know, it was a little bit like learning your letters or learning how to read or write. You got a, you had a philosophy tutor, right. and also if you you know earlier period, you would hang around the marketplace. You would hang around. Stoa comes from the uh, it, it means porch or like colonnade. So think of like the Roman Forum, all those or, or Jefferson Memorial, beautiful colonnaded buildings. And then think of them frescoed, painted. And Stoa was called Stoa Poikile, painted colonnades, painted porch. And so these were guys, typically guys, that hung around and listened to philosophers tell them, you know, about stuff. And if you were wealthy, you had your own tutor. So Marcus Aurelius, obviously, wealthy emperor. He goes to battle um, on the Danube in the Germanic campaigns. And he writes these little notes to himself at night. He can't sleep. He wakes up in the middle of the night. He jots thoughts like many of us do in a diary. They come to be the meditations, sort of, uh, but he didn't call them that. And he says, if you've ever seen a body with its limbs separated one from another this one. on the battlefield, that's what it is when we cut ourselves off from each other. And then he says over and over again, we're in this world for cooperative endeavors, for cooperating 
together. And for him in this period, it's very reason centric. You know, everyone who is a human being shares in common reason and that's the connection. And so we have, he's, and then another person says, imagine you're a little center in uh, in, in a picture with concentric circles going round and round and round. Bring the outermost circle to you. So not just kith and kin, and not just tribe, and not just race, those are their terms, but the outer circle of humanity. Bring it to you and do it with zeal and respect. That's what it is to be connected to each other. That's a project. It's not, oh. it's not religion. It's a secular project of learning how to live together cooperatively with, across borders. Because this is, this is a period of expansion, I'll be honest. It's the Roman Empire. They're expanding across the globe. But they're also breaking down borders and they're trying to figure out what's common in all of humanity so that we can have discourse together. So I think of that, those two metaphors as clinching in some ways, the core message of the stoic, we'll call it cosmopolitanism, but it isn't really what we think. It's sort of a, a global outreach. Um, the word comes from before the stoics. It's from this, this very colorful character, um, Diogenes. And he, um, he was Diogenes the cynic. He was Cynic is from a Greek word for dog, and he was mad or mad as a dog. He was crazy as a dog because he was very anti-conventional. But he, and one of the anti-conventional things he did was he said, I'm a citizen of everywhere and nowhere. I'm a citizen of the world. And that term, um, a, a citizen of the cosmos, cosmos means world, it is what the Stoics were about figuring out how to come together in from all these disparate corners of the world to make us one humanity. So that's really, you know, how I think of stoic wisdom, lessons for creating a better world through discourse, empathy, and outreach of connection. So it isn't just you know, suck it up and truck on. <laughs> right. Well, I tell you, you know, <clears throat> when I did a little deep dive into your work, I, I, it, there is no subject that could be better timed for our times because we're in this inflection point in history where we're trying, where most people would not say, oh, I love these times. This could go on forever as far as I'm concerned. No, <laughs> most people do not like the acrimony and the outrage and the fear and all that. And it doesn't really have any reflection on personal politics. It's just that I don't think we're really built to embrace the level of acrimony and fear that, we, that we're all experiencing from our online lives and from the news media. I, I and, agree. Yeah. Um, and yet here we are with this huge chunk of our time spent in this online world that I that I'm always telling people is only a slice of reality. So I came across uh, your article just yesterday. Uh, you had this great article in the Washington Post that came out about the myths of Stoicism. And so we've got probably two kinds of people, people that, that know of Stoicism um, enough to know, to say, oh, I thought that's the way it was with Stoicism. Or we got people who are totally fresh to this whole concept, which is great. Um, and I, I think we could use those five myths that you talked about as a little framework to get people familiar with some of the wonder that is really at our disposal uh, as far as coping mechanisms and ways to perceive struggle and um, the kinds of things that we're all facing right now at trying to find our footing in a new world. So sure. can we kind of use that article as a basis? I, Sure. We'll you, a, you may have to prompt me a little bit. It's oh, I've got it. I, I, I've got it, sister. <laughs> I, I, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it. I, I highlighted um, a few parts that I really like in each section. So Super. I'll ask you from that. So, okay. 
So um, we've really covered that <laughs> this stoicism could come to the ordinary people like me in from this angle where it's used like with the British stiff upper lip, you know, that, uh, that that's, that's the whole essence of it, but it's so much more than that. And one of the myths, um, I love that you started out this piece for the Washington Post with this one. The myth, one of the myths is that stoicism is about being tough because that's totally the way it was used in context when I was growing up. Yeah. And if, if you didn't happen to run across anything else, that's what you would think stoicism was about was toughness. But you say one of the nicest things there, you say, um, uh, yes, the Stoics wanted to arm us against the slings and arrows of misfortune, but they insist that we lose our humanity if we try to become invulnerable. So the idea often that you find for Stoicism, and it's really a popular myth, is that Stoicism makes you bulletproof. It's a phrase I hate, yeah. and I hate also the phrase invulnerable, or some people, some of the entrepreneurs use the phrase anti-fragile, that you're not fragile. But slings and arrows of fortune, and also of not just fortune, but of injustice right. and, and cruelty, human to human, can really, really disarm you. Mm -hmm. They can break you. We're not, we're, you know, we're not uh, metal that, you know, I mean, we bend and the idea is to bend, but we, we, we do break sometimes. And the Stoics themselves knew that. Seneca writes that, that he grieves for the loss, he can he sheds tears, and he says we we're at peril of losing our humanity if we think we're invulnerable. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my view isn't that every single downside is itself an upside. No, there are some tragedies. I have friends who've lost children at very very early ages. Um. It is taking years to come out of that with the most supportive systems. We, they didn't break, but boy, they hurt. And to think that every, or to welcome downside because it might have an upside. They aren't all opportunities. We, we deal and we deal as best we can, but we're not bulletproof. And the worst thing you can do, I think, is to send individuals, men and women, to battle, deploy them to Iraq, Afghanistan, Persian Gulf, wherever they are, South America, Colombia, and American troops, and think and tell them that you're invulnerable. It's a, it's a horrible, horrible way to prepare your troops. They're not. And I, I know too well from sitting on suicide review boards at the Pentagon. We are not invulnerable. So don't use stoicism to say you're invulnerable. It, and that's a myth I'm out to debunk because the stoics themselves debunk it. Mm -hmm. Now that gets to something I think that um, there's a there's a interest in in society right now is that, you know, um, I think it's it's gonna bond us together if we're if the goal isn't to be invulnerable. If we can all stop walking around with this armor and and connect deeply with the things that we can all agree upon our our struggles um, i agree and we we <laughs> we don't we, we we actually wear our vulnerabilities out on our sleeve a little bit that's a super way to connect with the humanity and another person who might not think at all like you on six other things but might agree that this, this thing that we're all facing that's so ugly um, deserves our process, deserves well, some process. I think um, the pandemic, which we're still in really, it's not, it hasn't gone away, despite the amazing, amazing global cooperative progress of medicine, um, has told us that we're in it together. For better or worse, we're in it together. And the solutions are cooperative solutions. And the folks that are on the front lines across all of humanity have been there to help and they've suffered the costs of it, mm -hmm. sometimes very, very 
um, closely. And now little, I have, a, I have a young grandchild, I'm expecting another. We're, we're worried about little kids and their exposure and we need the help of others to be socially responsible to protect our children. We don't, we don't know what long COVID is like. We have, it's being worked on. And it is a, speaking of the frontiers of knowledge and future thought, the most brilliant you know, folks in medicine are really working long and hard to figure out the long-term effects. But that's, a, you, can't do, you can't do science unless you're connected, that's the bottom line. Yeah. Science is a international project of research and that will get us out. So we, we're, I mean, we're, we, we do break physically and mentally and we need each other in order to connect to see um, brighter futures. So yeah, well, bulletproof is, or tough it out at all costs, not a way to go. Some grit, but I call it stoic social grit. It's what wow. connects us together, stoic social grit. Uh, that's a lovely term. That's a lovely term because that's where um, that's that's where we we've all got um, a place to lean. No one's alone in this world, and and that is where we've got a place to lean. There's always someone who's willing to, you know, le lend a shoulder. That's right. I've, I've just had the darndest experiences in life where strangers have read an emotion or read a situation the right way when I, when I was in a complex situation and. And that is, um, that is what connects us all is this human way that we can um, interpret other people without much said between us and well, so help. Let me, yeah, so let me just think about that in terms of the Stoics. So the Stoics are often thought of as emotionless. Right. That's really what it is to have a stiff upper lip, which you know, I think is a British phrase. Um, and the Queen and Prince Philip were the royal family or the, right. the paragons of it. Yeah. if you read the royal, uh, the press, the British press. But there's also this sense of, um, the Stoics were probably the sing, they're not, there are many of them, you know, lots of different names, not just one person, but they were brilliant about emotions, really prescient. They thought a lot about the different layers of emotions, that there's some starts and startles we have that do show on our face. We turn green, we blush, we, we pale, um, we, we cry, unforced tears, they just come out. We, we have shivers. They talk about generals whose knees knock. Seneca says, his, you know, you hear the battle cry and the knees start knocking the, or the most seasoned orator, his fingers start, start twitching a little bit when he gets on stage. These are very natural, you might call them proto emotions, early emotions, arousals. They're emotional arousals and they show, as you say. Um, then there are ordinary emotions, fear, anger, uh, joy, desire. And some of those, as you were saying earlier, run away. They outleap reason. That's the yes. stoic phrase. They outleap reason. And those, Seneca, again, one of the more brilliant stoics, I think, says, you sometimes have to monitor them. You have to attend to the impulsive impressions that are coming in and the impulsive reactions that you're poised to take, whether it's, well, ah, or it's, you're gonna, you know, you wanna hit someone out, punch someone out. You have to monitor your attention, he says. And you have to, you know, I, I interpret, you have to hit the pause button. You have to, stand back and reflect. Now, there are natural threats out there and you don't want to stand back and reflect if a, beer, a bear is in your face. Or, you know, my husband was cycling and got hit by a deer and, and he wasn't standing back. You know, he was zigging, zagging on his bicycle trying to avoid the deer, it didn't work. But he, was, he wasn't um, uh, pausing in any way. He was really reacting fast and in a way to a natural threat. But sometimes, we misinterpret the threats. We, we see people as hostile when they're not. We see them as against us when we're not, or we see them as enemies when they're not in any way, or they don't look like us. And so they're other. 
And so the Stoics really have a very remarkable solution. It's one we think about in modern psychology, and that is that you sometimes have to think slow and not fast. Mm -hmm. And that requires inserting a pause, hitting the pause button. And that's some way we regulate emotions. And then they talk about how you cultivate good ones. And those good ones could be kindness, goodwill, benevolence, rational caution, wariness. You know, you're wary of a strange environment, but you might not leap into some uh, or, or engage in risky behavior um, in response. And they also, surprisingly, again, back to the earlier point about stiff upper lip or not showing any emotions, they talk a lot about what you were referring to, the expression of emotions. Seneca says, if you give a gift and you have a grimace or furrowed brow, it's like giving bread with stones in it. Oh, that <laughs> it is says, such a great. It's as good as not giving. Or if you show gratitude with a really angry face, furrowed brow, it's as good as not saying thank you. So that they knew that emotions aren't just feelings. They're also how we show our feelings or sometimes how we perform. We don't always show on our face what we're really feeling, but sometimes the appearance is what matters. And they were masters of the stage in a certain way because a lot of, you know, pretense is the royal road to, to, to sincerity, as it's sometimes said. You, you really do have to practice sometimes, as we know when raising children, you have to show a lot on your face because that's, as you say, that's how we pick up the cues, the uptake. We pick up the social cues through emotions. So the Stoics weren't getting rid of all of that. They were really smart about managing it, but really smart also about knowing the dangers of runaway anger mm -hmm. and the dangers of runaway fear. I mean, mm -hmm. they're living in the time of Nero. Seneca is writing from the court of Nero, and he knows what runaway rage is about. I mean, he, right. Yeah. So, well, that, that is that is a key point that I don't want people to miss is that this is what's so remarkable about this. When I read quotations from the Stoics, I mean, all you have to do is go to the latest newspaper and you can see applications for every single bit of wisdom in our modern life 2000 years later. I mean, that to me is the real test of wisdom. That's right, I, it's I, time, I, time, time honored and yeah, read the sources, I always say, go back and read them, they're so readable, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, and if you can't read the sources, <laughs> I really do. I pour over them in order to sort of show what the lessons are for ourselves, whether it's surviving a difficult political climate, whether it's surviving a way of coming together in this world, mm -hmm. a change. racial reckoning change, yes. and that change is critical because mm -hmm. the country wasn't always built in wasn't at all built in equitable mm -hmm. ways let's be honest mm -hmm. um it wasn't so um i and and also thinking about the work of i was in the netherlands giving talk and there was this amazing fireman art and he uh came to a scene in a very very small dutch village where his four firemen were already there it was christmas eve and, and it was a chinese restaurant and the children and family live above the Chinese restaurant. And the firemen had already kind of ventured up, but they couldn't get inside the building. And he came, he's the captain. He surveyed the scene and he had to make the really tough call that there was no way that they could save the children or save themselves. And he had to break that to the firemen who were ready to risk their lives to save these children, but it would have been a futile mission. Mm -hmm. He also had to tell the parents who were outside, they had been working in the restaurant when I presume a grease fire or something like that just erupted. And he had compassionate stoic resilience that day. 
it was really, really near impossible to tell these firefighters bent on saving and rescuing that they couldn't. There was no point. And then he had to tell the parents. And he also had the wisdom after this. I mean, they perished. The children perished. He was thinking of his reputation. He wasn't thinking of his reputation, but his wife was when he came home that evening because there had been a previous rescue operation that didn't work. Small, small. I mean, Netherlands is tiny. Okay. Small town, small village. And she had heard it on the news, what was going on. And she worried for his reputation. He wasn't worried because he knew he did the right thing. But then he also did an amazing thing, which is part of the protocol. He gathered those firemen together for psychological debriefing afterwards so they could work through the loss. I thought that was such enlightened resilience. And I tell his story in Stoic Wisdom that he had the presence of mind to do that. And he also had the presence of mind to, to continue to work with this team so that they could continue to do their job in the face of, we can go back, the slings and arrows of fortune. It was a horrible, horrible accident to have to process mm -hmm. and then continue to be professional. And many of us in various walks of life have these incidents. Some of them are accidents. Some of them really are human created and social structures that exclude. And we all have obligations one-on-one -on -one or institutionally to figure out how to come together um, in, in that way. Th this wasn't an emotionless engagement by any mean. Mm -hmm. He was working as a compassionate, resilient person. I, I, well, I, I teared hearing his story. I really mm -hmm. did. It was so moving to me. Well, and that, that's what I've found is the um, the day to day uh, practical benefit of of reading Stoicism periodically is that um, there was a time when my husband and I would each read a passage from a, a book that we were using and we'd say, OK, today, this is what we're going to keep top of mind. And and sure enough, every day something would come across our path that would challenge that notion that we started out with in the day and we got some practice. That's great. That is really and, great. You know, this is the this is the way we grow. This is the way we we grow in the eyes of others because you know, in these times if you're a leader in any capacity, you need people to to know that you're working, you're trying, you know. Um, so let's take a break and we're going to uh, make a break and talk about a community that we started at Everwinding Circles called the Con Conspiracy of Goodness Network. And um, it is that kind of network of support for life struggles and the, um, the good things that we all envision being able to do for each other. And um, I want to head right down a path uh, with Nancy that might be helpful to us all in the way we um, I just mentioned before the break how my husband and I were really, uh, and we still we we still read uh, w whenever we get a chance, just a page turners about stoicism, or just dive in anywhere. I have a couple of books, Nancy, where I'll just open it randomly and read what's on the page, and then try and find opportunities to practice that bit of insight in the day. Um, but there's something here that I really loved in your Washington Post article. So we're treating it, we're treating it when we do that, like self-help. And you make a really strong point. Uh, now, okay, I, I, I should preface that with, you know, I'm trying to be a better leader on my staff of nine at Everwinding Circles and my staff of 12 at, at the dental office. So, you know, when I help myself, I'm probably going to become a better person for all these people who are counting on me, my patients and everything else. But, but really, it is easy to slip into stoicism and treat it like self-help. But you've got a much broader, much more wonderful interpretation of how they meant this insight to be used. Right. Well, the Stoics, like any of the ancient philosophers, were really about virtue, it's a you know overused word and we don't really know what it means but it, it's a it's goodwill goodwill to self but also to others we live in social worlds aristotle said we're social by nature social animals and the stoics 
really held on to that tightly. And the idea was that you, yeah, you meditate. I mean, not silent meditation, but it was more reflect, reflect on the yeah. good things you did during the day and the bad things that you did during the day in terms of how you treated other people. And, but yet it's of late, it's become uh, one of the self-help industry mm -hmm. uh, popular things, a kind of book you would pick up in an airport on self-help. Yeah. And where self-help is really about me, about my flourishing, about my doing my best. But my best is typically getting ahead in the world. It's being a better entrepreneur. The people that promote it often are entrepreneurs. They're out there in maybe in Silicon Valley or other places. And they're thinking about tough deals, about the stress of <laughs> making more money. Yes. I mean, these are billionaires. Yeah. You know, Jack Dorsey, head of Twitter, um, uh, who is a kind of self-professed stoic. Um, they're worried really about problems most of us wouldn't even dream of. The Stoics were really about, I mean, they did live in, some of them lived in, well, Seneca was in Nero's palace and that was not a pretty place. I mean, politically or in terms of temptation, you know, it was filled with opulence, but it was about the training and moral progress is a term they use a lot to become better. And one of the ways is to think of yourself in a cooperative endeavor right. through reason, cooperation. And, you know, if the Stoics are worth reading, it's because they exhort you to become a better self connected to others and doing good deeds. And that's the reason to read them. It's not so that you can just tame your fears or quiet your anger. You know, there's enough anger management programs out there. You don't really need the Stoics for that. And there's enough, I mean, try, I'm not, I don't know enough about Buddhism, but you know, I would think quieting, I meditate in the morning in a, you know, in a, a Eastern way of just sort of quieting the babble. But that's really for me so, a calm can wash over me in a way. And I'm sure right. it changes my brain waves. I'm sure it does. I, you know, I'm not a bio you know, a, a neurologist, um, but I'm sure it changes some pattern that goes up on right. in my brain. But the Stoics were moral philosophers. They were about ethics and the training, if you, and practice, if some people say i I, some people these days say, I, 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 I practice stoicism. I sort of think, well, what do you do when you practice stoicism? <laughs> well, it isn't about me. Sure, me, you, can't, you can't act in the world unless you're whole and integrated. But you were always thinking of, there's a phrase of, um, called, you know, sort of healing the world, being part of the world that brings us together you talk about widening you know circles that is the metaphor mm -hmm. you are a center in a concentric series of a series of concentric circles where you bring the sorry you bring the outermost inner and that is the stoic mantra if you like right. connecting to each other in a way that makes us whole in my classrooms when i teach if i read one of the stoics epictetus maybe um, you know, it's a, a lot about overcoming your fear, overcoming your anger, don't scream at people, um, um, don't worry about death, prepare for it because we're all mortal. Yeah. And so one of my students said, you know, if this is about me and self, then Professor Sherman, it's really not the ethics we've been studying all year. And I thought, boy, did this first year student nail it. <laughs> Yeah, he nailed it. Yeah. And that's so important for our time. So I love your story. Your, I, and I think people would enjoy the, the, the nice quotes that you could help us just, uh, I want to get people interested in stoicism because I found it sure. such a great, um, my, my big thing these days is to talk a lot about the greater good. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm working on book number two, and I've got this little section where um, we should put everything through the three, two or three generation test. So what seems so good right now to be joining on board with? You know, will it stand the test of time? Will, well, 2000 years ago, these, these, these writings were made and they still serve us today. So what practices are we engaging in right now that will look completely crazy to generations two from now? But um, what is going on in society right now that, that could be, um, that the Stoics could be helpful with that we're all struggling with? Like for instance, your last point in the Washington Post thing is, um, is that it's kind of, uh, it's one of the common notions about stoicism is that it teaches you to be indifferent to things that, that it just, it, is, it, it gives you some kind of um, perspective that helps you just level everything. And so you can't, but that's, that's not what it's about at all. No, so, so yeah, it's a So tell us how we, we use stoicism to handle, let's say, okay. <laughs> so every day, Nancy, people, because of what I do with ever widening circles, telling people about all the good that's happening in the world, people constantly are telling me, you know, I've turned off the news entirely. I've just tuned it out. And I don't even listen to NPR anymore. It's just too negative. I'm not doing it. And I, for me, you know, I think we need to know about the world. I, I so, so yes, it may be um, doom and gloom times a thousand, but I, we still need to know certain things are happening in the world. And I would rather work on my, my way of reacting to negative news than tuning it out entirely and just not knowing. Great. So the, a, a wonderful way of thinking about how to interact with the world. The Stoics don't say you should be indifferent to the world, apathetic, numb. No, that's not it. They think that you should treat things that are outside you in, with a different kind of, I'll, I'll use a sort of phrase that uh, you sort of said, a different kind of approach and avoidance. Mm -hmm. So you approach things or, you know, that you might get really sticky attachments to, really, really like that, or get really, really angry at something, so uh, 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 aversive towards something. Mm -hmm. They think that there are other ways of reacting. So you can, you can have a kind of more measured, a less sticky or less acquisitive. I don't really want it so badly. So you, you know, it's nice, but it's not something I have to have. Or in the case of something that's really negative, the negative news out there, it's really making my blood boil. Well, maybe you don't like it, but you don't have to have that kind of reaction that riles you up and that really engages you in a way that really makes you immobile. You can't really respond rationally. So they have different ways of, they call it, they have their own words, they're filled with too much words, but you know, a way of selecting and diselecting or preferring and dispreferring. And they're calmer reactions. It doesn't mean you're indifferent to them. It means you have a more measured response to them. Again, that pressing the pause button. So you're not impulsive in the face of it or really, really aversive in, you know, in, in hating something. And that's a really, really helpful way. Some people think of it as behavioral cognitive therapy of a sort, right? Because you're seeing it in a different light. You're the you, you have a different kind of way of, of hearing the news or seeing the news. And you also, a, a different way of appraising it. It's not, a, you're not so heavily engaged in it. And you're also, you, you, um, you behave a little differently. You're, you, you, you know, your body comes down, your temperature lowers. Now, the trick here is that we need a fair bit of oomph and impetus, including anger, I think, to do good deeds. And let me just sort of tell a story for a minute. One of the most amazing persons that I talk about in Stoic Wisdom is someone I interviewed years ago. I was at the Naval Academy. It was 30 years post-Vietnam. And it was time to commemorate Vietnam. I was working side by side with uh, Marine, Marine captains, Naval admirals. Um, I interviewed Jim Stockdale, the longest standing POW. I knew McCain a little bit through him. They were 
in the same prisoner of war camp. And so I brought to the academy, and then I later brought to Georgetown, this man named Hugh Thompson. He was a warrant officer, a helicopter pilot. He saw one morning in the mid 60s, a massive ditch filled with wreathing bodies. That ditch was in a place we now know as My Lai. He saw the My Lai massacre in Vietnam. He stopped his helicopter, he got out and he said to his side gunner, Larry Colburn and another co-pilot, um, Andriotti, who didn't survive Vietnam, if the GI shoot at me, shoot back. That was a very, very controversial order. It was an order given to specifically Lieutenant Callie and Captain Medina, who we know committed the crimes of My Lai. I teach this regularly. If Hugh Thompson didn't have a little bit of anger, and I heard the anger 30 years later in my office as he talked to me, if he didn't have what I'll call moral outrage, righteous indignation, he would not be able to have done the brave act he did. He stood because women, men, Buddhist monks, children were still being taken out of huts and marched to their death at rifle point. So don't think of stoicism as calm, no emotions, full indifference. You need some anger, I think, in order to generate the moral response that's often required to do good in the world. He did, I think, one of the most remarkable acts in war. He stood up and defied his fellow, his fellow soldiers because they were, in fact, committing atrocities. They were cr crimes against humanity of a sort. So okay, so, so to, um, to sort of connect that story to our real lives and the news, you know, there's plenty to be outraged about. <laughs> true. There's just so much. True. Okay. Too, too true. And I, I, I will admit that I, I have been trying to, um, to work with stoicism to find a new perspective to help me handle the outrage. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. You know, one of the things, uh, and, and I'm going to think about it differently now, thanks to you. Thank because you. I know um, a little bit of anger is what makes me get up at 4.30 every single morning. Because I look at it like a terrifying injustice that most people think the world's going to hell in a handbasket. When I can tell you the world is, is full of amazing things. But let's people. say, I'm going to just jump in here because it, it is because we can see the positive side of it and we commit ourselves to do good in the world. If I didn't think that I could make a difference in the world, and I mean it, whether it's in yes. the classroom, whether it's, I keep in touch with one Marine, he's not a Marine anymore, he's a war correspondent, but he's going back to his sites where he lost his buddies. And I know their stories, I know the tattoos on his arm, I, know, I took him to Walter Reed to visit buddies that didn't end up making it. I, if I didn't think I could contribute in good ways to help heal him, to know that I'm with him, you know, sort of this motherly <laughs> professor of his, you know, but, you know, sort of a doctor of sorts. I, I know my limits and I also know that I'm a teacher. I'm not a therapist to my students, but I get attached to those students, really attached. And he's doing his work in the world. He's, he's doing good in the world. And I feel if I'm, you know, I teach at a university that's committed to bringing us together. That is Georgetown's mission. We have a very, very diverse population, international. We are bringing our, this is now just, we're bringing us back to the campus. You can't imagine how important this is in the eyes of an 18 to 22 year old who has been in a, in a closet 
<laughs> for a year and a half taking classes. It may seem you know, like a privilege to be able to go to a campus, but if you're laying out that money or you're on a full scholarship or you're in a sport and you haven't been able to see a friend and you're 18 to 22 years, this is huge. So I, I adore making the difference by teaching. That's my mission. I adore it. I happen to have a year off from teaching, so I wrote a book about that. But the book wouldn't have any energy or steam unless it was based on all of the connections I make in the classroom or I make with service members or my community. I'm just engaged in the community. So I'm with you. But a little bit of, let's call it impetus, impulse uh, um, for the good. Not flat. You know, we're dead if we're flat. You're not flat. I can see all the energy that exudes out of you. I'm not flat. I kind of, I'm a dancer as well. So, you know, I, I could dance on tabletops, um, you know, <laughs> in a classroom if I have to entertain my students, <laughs> if they're falling asleep. I'm sure you'd go for it. <laughs> I would. <laughs> so, I'm, so I'm with you. Um, but it doesn't have to be filled with venom is what we don't need. That doesn't this is, do any, any. Yeah, this is something that's in the article in the Washington Post too that I, I did want to talk about before we wrap up is one of the bigger overarching um, places where I see acrimony gets so damaging because I agree that you have to have a fire in your belly um, for something that, that deserves the long haul champions. I'm yes, telling you, I, I watched on PBS the story of women getting the right to vote if, if anybody suffrage did, yeah oh yeah. my gosh my husband and I watched that thing and we kept turning to each other every five minutes saying you've got to be kidding me I I went to a, went yeah through. I know I went to a oh. college, college founded on that on suffrage yeah yes yeah, so I'm, you I'm so, yeah. so so a bit of 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 fire, fire in your, in your belly, belly is is probably necessary for those long haul commitments that we all make in life but here's what I wanted to ask you about one of the things I notice, and I and I'm noticing a sea change um, in the world, is that most of us, many of us, have had it with the chaos builders, with the people that are just spouting off randomly, without thought, without actually a goal of being helpful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, so I think we're turning to look for the helpers, the thoughtful people, the people who can speak about hard things as a measured voice just like you said. Right. And right. I think it's all about protecting other people's dignity. Talk to me about dignity. Dignity is critical. So dignity is probably a Rome, you know, it's a Latin term dignitas, and it means a sense of the worth humanity that individuals have across the globe. And it requires a, a, a different attitude than many of us show. And it requires to, to honor dignity, you have to show respect. Respect means, is from the, it's from Latin, it means to look. And I often think of it when I teach, I think of it as you have to look someone in the eye, right. one to one, see them, not look over them, right. not despise not contemn, condemn or, or feel contempt, but it's actually to see. It's, a, it's from the verb to see. That's and true. to see respectare, to see them in a way, in a light that shows their humanity. And so uh, um, an enlightenment thinker, Immanuel Kant, sort of in the 18th century, read the Stoics through and through, and he has a moral dictum, which is essentially respect persons as ends in themselves and not means. That is the moral law, meaning respect them, don't exploit them, don't make them servile, don't pull the wool over their eyes, don't lie to them, don't deceive them, that's using them. Dignity requires respecting them in their own right as people who can make choices, but subject to the harmonious choosings of others. You can't make any choice and you can't just say it's my right, no matter what. 
it has to be compatible with the good of society. Oh, what, that, that good. what that good is, is very hard to determine. And we all yeah. have different ideas. We will have different conceptions of the good. But the good has to allow for others beside yourself or your group or your religion or your race or your gender or whatever it is, whatever your identity is, to be able to flourish, flourish. side by side with you. That requires respecting dignity. And it requires all these psychological tools we've been talking about, monitoring your quick impressions, pressing the pause button. It requires not letting your anger or fear outrun reason. You may, you know, that's a hard trick if you're in line of defense and you're, you know, and you're dealing on the front lines with life threat day in and day out, but it's still your duty because the other persons are worthy of dignity. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think of stoicism and, you know, I was just sort of in the book, I, I give maybe four bits of, of a healthy stoicism that come from the stoics. Psychological mastery can't be at the cost of human vulnerability. You can't make yourself invulnerable. It just won't work. Okay. Two, reliance on other depends on building communities of cooperation, respect for dignity and support. Three, denying your pain, whether it's of your body or of your mind, is not a permanent solution for grit. It's a dead end. It's a dead end. Four, and finally, monitoring quick impressions includes watching for distortions and bias and preconceptions you don't even know you have mm -hmm. produced by fear and anger as well as desire. That's straight out of the Stoics. That's ancient wisdom. That's not me making it up. It's me studying as you do these texts and digesting them. And I, you know, I think that's the way to try to not retreat from the world. Stoicism is not about accept and acquiesce. It is not about give up the battle. It is about waking up and creating a world, as the Stoics said, that is a, a world of citizens of the world worthy of respect. So that's my mission. That's really why I wake up in the morning. It's why, you know, I am promoting the book, you know, and I, through articles in the New York Times and Washington Post, in part because I really feel this is a way to go forward. You don't have to belong to this religion or that religion. You don't have to belong to this party or that party. You don't have to start politicizing masks or no masks, nothing like that. It's about reading some ancient wisdom so we can get rid of this acrimony. I'm with you. I don't want to raise kids in a world where there's acrimony. I'm expecting a new grandchild any day. I want, I want it to be a brighter, happier future for my kids and grandkids. Well, if it's any comfort <laughs> from my vantage point, it is, there is an enormous wave of goodness and progress happening in the world that almost no one knows about yet. But that time is coming. This, this, this wave is like a rising tide and it is going to lift all the, the boats in the harbor up. I sure and, hope you're right. <laughs> and you are so much a part of it, Nancy. So where um, everybody can connect to all kinds of places in your world. They can get the book on um, on Amazon, I'm assuming, Barnes & Noble and all that? Yeah, your favorite bookstore. It's okay. available. It's out. Um, you can, you know, it looks like this. And it's it's a beautifully made book. I have yeah. to thank the graphic designers. Uh -huh. um, yeah, Stoic Wisdom. You can find it anywhere. Okay. Amazon has it. And if you like it, review it. It, it takes one sentence. You too, Dr. Linda, you could review it. Oh, I will. I have it ordered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it should get to you in a day. <laughs> well, I love, you know what I do? I'll share this with folks. On the people that I know I need to get in there and stay in there, 
for me to have access to their knowledge. I, I buy the audio book. Have you recorded the audio book? The audio book will be out July 4 through recorded books. It's not there yet. So okay. I have to say you may have to rely on Kindle or, um, you know, or hard. That's okay. And I did my own. I know what a nightmare it is. <laughs> so we're, it's, it's coming, but you know, uh, and it won't, it won't be me speaking. So you can, you can thank the audience can thank the fact that they won't have to hear an unpracticed. <laughs> it will be an actress, uh, you know, oh. a, a, a recording actor. That's great. Well, I always get both on these books. Oh, that's that super. I, know. I know, I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. And then I, I listen to them and I read and annotate in the books and things seem to stick a lot harder. That's a great way uh, through, yeah. through, through ears and through eyes. That's a great, yeah, a great really, way, really but is. it's, it's out and it's getting really fantastic. Uh, pick so if up people and, want to um, dabble here and there, they're going to get your book. Is there any kind of a, kind of a master collection of just stoic wisdom that you recommend? Like I, my husband and yeah, I have been yeah. diving into. So I, I said this at the end of the New York Times article and I really, really meant it. And it's because how, how I, how I teach subscribe to Seneca's letters on ethics. You don't have to subscribe to an online site of which there's a million, million podcasts. Oh, okay. By subscribe, I mean buy Seneca's letters on ethics. Oh, there's a book. There's a book. It's called, he wrote it called Letters on Ethics. Okay. And two colleagues um, really did a great, great job of these translations. Uh, Margaret Graver and um, A. A. Long, classicists, um, who translated the Latin. It's so readable. And the, they're one or two page letters. They're, they're, it's um, sort of to a student named Lucilius, a uh -huh. public servant, a civil servant. Yeah. But they never were sent. It's an art form and, yeah. epi, you know, of epistle writing, epistolary art. Yeah. And they're really to himself, but they're to all of us. He meant them okay. to survive. He, okay. he clearly had posterity in mind yeah. and they are very readable. So, okay. and you will see a lot of it in here. It's okay. I, I, my main source isn't Marcus Aurelius or, or, or Epictetus that many draw on. There's a lot of bombast in Epictetus, shock and awe. I don't go in for shock and awe. I'm yeah. not in, you know, um, you'll see a lot of standing here. So start here and then it will pique your, pique your imagination to go great. further. Sound great. good? That sounds great. And have, have people have some critical thinking going when you, if you were to just go and look this up online, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. because as, as we're not going to name names and but as Nancy has indicated there's folks that are really taking the entrepreneurial <laughs> angle with stoicism and and you will be sold <laughs> <laughs> and there are folks who are her taking um the purely self-interest um angle with stoicism but the ones that you know are, are the right places, you'll feel it. You'll be able to tell that this is about the greater good. And they're, they're, choosing, they're choosing to highlight um, stoicism uh, insights that are stoic insights that are about how we can all live a better life and have a better world together. So the rallying call at the end of Seneca's on anger is let us cultivate humanity. And what he means by that is let us work together to build a better future for the common good. That's really what he means by that. And, and if you can feel that at a place that you that you discover on the internet, then you're probably going to be okay. But do look out for the, uh, the other angles. That's right. So thank you so much for joining us, Nancy. It's just been an absolute delight. So anything we have the greatest podcast um producers streamline podcast does our podcast and they they make fabulous show notes anything that you and i referred to is going to be in the show notes so people have connection to your book and and every thing that you and i referred to and um you know thanks to our affiliate partners we, we have these affiliate partners that help prove it's still an amazing world um you can find information about them in the show notes as well and as always, take a deep dive into everwideningcircles.com. To get there, you can go to ewc.co quickly. And I hope these connections to all this goodness and, and progress that we've been talking about carry you through the week, and you'll find all the wonder and joy that we've been talking about. That's Thanks great. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. And just on a similar note, nancysherman.com is where you can find... Um, 
all my books and this one nancysherman.com just pull down the book tab and you can even order it straight from that website that's great easy to see yeah okay nancy you're making thank the you. world a better thank you so much my pleasure thank you so much for a great interview okay